Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar Hotep with the Madhu Mandela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. And I am here with you on today, which is what? Saturday, uh, September the 29th, uh, 21 minutes after I said that I was actually going to start. And um, I appreciate all of you who, um, you know, were on time. I apologize for the tardiness. Um, I had a little technical difficulty, and so I was trying to log in to the same, I mean, to the this one account on two different computers using the same uh, account. So, so I was trying to log uh, hold in. Hold on one sec, let me turn this volume off on this phone. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't let me log in on my other computer using my same account. So I logged in under another account that I have and I'm able, so I'm, I'm gonna be switching computers, you know, on you uh, for tonight. So some of this talk for tonight, I'm going to do kind of like how we're doing now. Uh, and then other aspects of the talk, I'm going to be um, referring to either a PowerPoint or um, a PDF file. Uh, so to speak. So let me double check a few things here. So bing, bada boom. First and foremost, peace to everyone who is listening live. And those of you who are in the chat room, um, I see Jerome Lockhart, Jolanda Zachary, uh, brother Eni Herit in the building, Devin Gavner, uh, forgive me if I pronounced that incorrectly. Uh, shout out to George Montgomery, Myriad Lucent Vibes, um, and anyone else I may have missed. So I think that's that's all of you at this current moment um, who decided to say what's up in the chat. So peace and blessings to you all. Um, so I'm just going to get started and. Let me go there, there. Okay, so today's topic is called the Tashaka Revolution and why African spirituality is not science. And so the inspiration for this talk was several different conversations I was seeing and participating in on and off uh, social media. So, you know, social media has, uh, is, is a, is a location for a lot of rich, uh, conversations. And so <laughs> I felt that I could lend some of my, uh, expertise as someone who is a, a practitioner of a number of African systems, as well as a scientist via computer science as well as someone who formerly studies uh, uh, Africa uh, uh, in the in the scholastic realm. And so I think I have a, a, a background that allows me to be a bit more well-rounded uh, when it comes to this particular subject. And so the, um, the, the, although I link the title, the, the, the variables of the title together, they're really in many respects two different conversations, but they come together uh, in a very unique way. So um, we might or might not be joined by uh, some others later on in the conversation. Uh, if they in fact decide to come on, of course, we'll let you know. Excuse me, I have my Arizona Energy Herbal Tonic commercial. I don't know why they really think this is Herbal time, but anyway. Um, so the the conversation centers around this notion. It was inspired by someone's uh, post in this one group who was saying something to the lines that if we just get our go back to our African spirituality, we'll be able to defeat the white man. And as an example of this, he brings up the Haitian Revolution. 
And while I won't go into the Haitian Revolution, uh, there is a misnomer that the, the Haitians were successful as a result of the practice of voodoo, as if voodoo was the tipping point that allowed them to uh, win the the battle against the French, uh, you know, to ultimately win their freedom. And I think that is an oversimplification and it does not take into account other variables, which includes, for example, the limited number of French troops that were actually on the island as a result of fighting multiple wars in Europe. And so they couldn't bring uh, their full weight in, in, a, in a normal way in which they would. And so, you know, in terms of the populations and other things, there was a lot of factors that tipped the scale in favor of the Africans in Haiti. Uh, but it definitely wasn't because some voodoo spirits, you know, uh, fought on behalf of the, the, the African Haitians uh in um at that time so uh it's a little bit more complex and that is a, a subject beyond uh what we're talking about here so i don't want to uh deal with that at this moment but that is the conversation that sparked this and so i i posted a number of small posts on facebook that you know hinted to my views as it regards this mentality that somehow juju or or african spirituality and quote unquote high science uh is going to somehow rid us of our conditions in relation to the uh in, in relation to uh, European people, especially uh, in the diaspora. And so I wanted to bring some clarity, you know, saying to that. And so as, as someone who was involved, not only in the, the computer sciences, and also as a historian, you know, I know for a fact that, you know, I get this question all the time for people who are just coming into consciousness and want to know more about African history. One of the first things that they always ask is why, if we had all this knowledge, we had all this sacred science, how did the European and the Arab defeat us? And so a lot of people will give some fancy explanation, but it's really simple that the Europeans and the Arabs had better technology. The technology allowed them to uh, move ar in the around the world and to take over land spaces uh, in, in ways that they couldn't do had they been in a time period where they simply had swords, uh, spears, and shields. And so Africans, we did not advance our technology in that fashion and we paid the price. And so there were other issues as well in terms of weather conditions, uh, famines, internal strifes, uh, non-unity in terms of the, the, the people. All of these things kind of play their particular role in the downfall of African people um, throughout the last, you know, uh, basically 1500 years to be exact. So, <clears throat> Beyond that, uh, you know, in these types of conversations, people will always uh, assume that spirituality and science can be equated. And I'm here to show that that is not the case. And not only is that not the case, that most people have spirituality, religion, and science uh, confused. They really don't know what this stuff is. And so we, we like to make arguments around things uh, based on popular etymologies and, and the like. And I'm, I'm actually going to have to do a totally separate um, 
a totally separate video or lecture just on what religion is. I won't have time to really get into it here, but religion is not what you think. Um, and so people in their disdain for Europeans and European words uh, want to say that Africans don't have religion. Africans indeed have religion. It is religion that keeps African communities together. Spirituality is a totally different thing. Um, and science is a totally different thing. And so, you know, we're going to get into that today. So I hope uh, y'all are with me. And I spoke enough where uh, we have uh, a few people could come in and join in the conversation. So let me ease out of there for a second. And so now I'm going to go to my slide show. Let me go from the beginning and we make sure something is. So I actually need to make sure that y'all are able to see the uh, hold on, hold on one second okay so i just check it on my phone real quick to see if y'all actually see uh, at least the first slide so as as spoken of earlier uh, the tashaka revolution and why african spirituality is not science and so i'll actually be talking about the tashaka revolution last um but i'm just going to make a few points um here <laughs> so i just want to say you know again we don't have time to really go into religion but i, I always like this proverb uh, it's from the yoruba people which says Iwani esid. character is religion and as i'll go into more detail in another lecture religion is uh, how you treat people in your community and how do you right the wrongs when you have offended or broken taboos in a particular community it is it is that which you do which binds the relationships between people in a community when people say that africans don't keeping with what we understand you know of of this concept and so uh, this this particular proverb speaks to that because it has to deal with good character, but the character and what you know your character and how you treat others that is the basis um, of this <laughs> so I want to first start off with mythology and so people think that people's cosmologies so to speak are actual cosmogenies and that's not the same thing. And we get our stories mixed up um, as it regards uh, mythologies and the like. So <laughs> I'm not seeing this refresh on this screen. So hopefully this will, uh, let me do live chat, let me see, tap the chart. If the screen, okay, my thing is acting up again. So hopefully y'all will um, see this. So the word myth uh, comes from um, a Greek mythos, which originally meant a succession of words with meaning or discourse. Later is restricted to fiction or myth. Another source says that myth is thus a representation of reality which though fantastic claims to be accurate and so when when you're reading a lot of myths people mistake the myths for scientific explanations and that is not the case i think uh in the text uh you know west african religions uh, Agdebole 1983, they kind of really explain very well what uh, 
myths really are. <laughs> and so he says, the myth is the prehistoric culture's attempt at answering the most perplexing questions posed by the supernatural and natural in creation. A myth is sometimes confused with a fable. Myths are not are rooted in reality, whereas fables are not. And so we should not mistake a, a myth for uh, fables, and but understand that myths have some grounding in reality. But just because it is grounded in reality doesn't make it a accurate, it doesn't make it an accurate description of reality. <laughs> and so a uh, myth, you know, comes from a word for a uh, speech or thought or a story, you know, anything delivered by a word of mouth, anything that you that any kind of story or poem or epic or thing to that nature is, in fact, by definition, a myth. Now, um, this is from the Online Etymological Dictionary. And there's another lecture which I do, which I demonstrate that the word myth is an African word. And the, the cognate for that in Egyptian is medu, as in medu nature. In the Yoruba language is odu. But that's another conversation for another time. <laughs> so back to uh, Agdebole, Agdebola. Uh, he goes on to say that myths are therefore hypotheses. They are constructed to offer explanation of phenomena. They are always literary hypotheses, not scientific hypotheses. They are poetic in style, hence the prevalence of personification of ab abstractions. In mythology, every abstract principle becomes an animal, a totemic ancestor, a human being, a human ancestor, or a divine being a divine ancestor. And so it is understood that when you come across myths, that they are in fact hypotheses. But there was no ex there was no experimentation or anything done to demonstrate these hypotheses. These are just educated guesses on how a particular phenomenon became to be or to try to explain the relationship between two or more phenomena but they are not scientific. And so this is this is coming from a book on West African religions. <laughs> so we ask ourselves, first and foremost, what is science? And so science is, hold on one sec, the use Um, I'm trying to make sure that this thing is acting right. Can't see the um, the conversation. Okay, so the science is the use of evidence to construct testable explanations and predictions of natural phenomena, as well as the knowledge generated through the process. So when we talk about science, science is something you do. It is a way of knowing through experimentation and testing. It is not intuition. It is not the spirits told me in a dream. It is not revelation through divination or any of that. That is not science. Science, the information comes by way of experimentation and testing. <laughs> I'll skip the, the etymology of the word science for a minute, but how science works. And so when we have these types of discussions, people don't understand how science actually works. If we understood how science works, we can determine whether something is scientific or not. So scientific knowledge and understanding accumulate from the interplay of observation and explanation. Scientists gather information by observing the natural world and conducting experiments. They then propose how the systems being studied behave in general, basing their explanations on the data provided through the experiments 
and other observations. They test their explanations by conducting additional observations and experiments under different conditions. And so this is very important to highlight because people think that just because you did um, a, a few trials, you know, a, a few ways of doing something that it is a scientific experiment. It is not. You have to do experiments over and over again, and then you have to introduce different variables over the process of doing these experiments. Experiments are done dozens upon dozens upon dozens of times. Then that's just by one individual or one research team. Then the experiments has to be done hundreds of other times by other scientists to make an argument that the initial hypotheses are in fact true. So other, as, as I just stated, other scientists confirm the observations independently and carry out additional studies that may lead to more sophisticated explanations and predictions about future observations and experiments. In these ways, scientists continually arrive at more accurate and more comprehensive explanations of particular aspects of nature. Again, <laughs> just because you, you discovered something doesn't mean that you discovered it scientifically. Chance and accident are always at play when we're doing scientific work. So what we do is we design experiments that attempts to eliminate chance as it regards the outcomes of the experiment. And so if, if you have not put in play mechanisms to eliminate chance, then in fact, that is not science. And so what people are, are, are toting around as science is in fact, not science. And this is something that we have to uh, understand uh, very well. I have not put in play, hold on, mechanisms to eliminate chance. Why is this sound? Uh, Okay. Sorry. Let me uh Ooh, beans. All righty. Hold on, I gotta see. Are y'all seeing? Hold on. Are y'all able to see? The slideshow in the um in the chat. If so or if not, someone um let me know. No, okay. Um I don't know what is going on here. No, okay. Um, hold on, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So why? Okay. Um, hold on. Then, in fact, that it is not science. Uh. I don't know what is going on here. So y'all seen slides in the beginning, but all of a sudden it went off. So, okay. Um, okay, I don't know what is going on with that and why you can't see the slides. So let me see. Uh, I apologize for that. Okay, this is what I'm going to have to do. Um, 
I don't know why. Like it's up on my in the back end, but it's not showing up on the screen. Um okay, wow, that's uh interesting. Okay. Interesting. Um, not moving. Okay. Um, let me see. Share my entire screen. Current slide. Um, but I, I I appreciate y'all, but I want y'all to at least see the the slides. And so there there's some things is better if you actually see it. Um. And so I don't want y'all to miss out because this thing is acting up. Um, I don't understand why. Okay, this is this is irking me, and I don't like technical difficulties. Um. So this is what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna try to switch some of these things over to the other computer. I'm just gonna stop that over there and get rid of this other account and I'm just going to upload these files real quick so I can download them to uh, this other computer. Yeah, uh, at Brother Jehuti, I was. See, I'm, I'm on two different accounts, and for some reason, the slideshow was showing in the beginning, but it just stopped all of a sudden. And so everything looked good over here, but it's not showing up uh, for you guys. So um, I'm seeing what I can do. Uh, so just, just bear with me a second. So I do uh, apologize. Normally everything else is on point. And so I don't like being on point when I do things. So uh, hopefully this won't take me long documents long go to books Oops, no i'm sorry e -books. um let's go to fukiao long and so uh, I wish like someone else was on the line so they at least talk while I do this. Um, so, info and SAR and hotel. Um, jibba jibba jabba. Let's add another file. Let's go to what do i have up here thing in the past okay um jordan and gabani this is four i'll put the mines 
Number four, open. Okay. <laughs> Someone said, call a friend. Yeah, the troubleshooting is interesting to watch, too, though. I'm just saying. My bad. Um, so I hate when I hate when technology doesn't do its the thizzle. So I got one more file to upload. Then I got to download um, to the other computer. And so these two computers are not connected at all. Otherwise, I would just do a, a system transfer. Um, but I don't have these um, computers networked uh, as of yet, which I guess this gives me incentive to do such a thing. So anybody watching this, make sure that you have your computers networked and everything running up to par like it's supposed to prior to you actually doing the show so um so one two three let's do that okay so now i go to this computer and I log in. Then I'm going to share this screen. And this is the computer that I normally do my presentations on. And so I don't know why I didn't just try to transfer everything here first. Uh, but you know, running on CP time, you you miss certain things the last minute. So um, hold on. I don't need it to open in there. I just need you to download. Let's do it like this. Download. Here we're going to download you. Here we're going to download you. So let's open up you. So boom, we have that. Let's open the view. No, I actually need you to open up. Show all. Okay, uh, show in folder. Almost there, people, almost there. So again, I apologize to everyone who is listening live. Uh, the having these technical difficulties and, you know, Microsoft, not Microsoft, but uh, Windows does not want to act right. And so uh, another reason to probably use a different type of system. Um, I'm going to open this other file. OK, so I'm going to do one more little test. It's not going to have the window. So let me get out of here. Boom. 
Boom. And so let me share my screen. So now I'm going to go here and ooh, ooh, ooh. Do, do, do. Um, okay, let's, I'll just start from the beginning there. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm looking at this other computer, it looks like the presentation is, is there. So can y'all see the screen? Um, type in the chat. If y'all can see the presentation. All righty, all righty. <laughs> so I'm I'm just going to just breeze through the through the the first part again and um till we get to the slide in which we were at. So I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all for uh waiting on me. So now we're gonna get started. So as I mentioned earlier. Um, religion has to deal with one's character, how you deal with people, and we'll deal with that in another presentation. And so, uh, as I mentioned, this this one phrase by the Yoruba people, "Iwa ni esin," which is character is religion. And so, people uh, saying that Africans don't have religion is this is wrong. And so, religion has to deal with how a community uh, creates institutes and taboos to shape character and behavior in such a way that um, the cohesiveness of the community uh, stays strong. And it puts in place uh, strategies to reconnect or rebind the relationships when they have been, in fact, uh, severed for some reason or another so if i you know um this decide to steal your cow for some reason of course you know everyone is seen as brothers and sisters in the community so you know that offense is not only an offense to the person whose cattle i stole but i have in fact offended the whole community so how do i repair those relationships that's what a religion has to deal with um so but spirituality and science are different things. And so I dealt with mythology earlier. And so uh, I'll just go to this, this slide here again, where it says that myths are therefore hypotheses. They are constructed to offer explanations of phenomena. They are always literary hypotheses, not scientific hypotheses. They are poetic in style, hence, the prevalence of personification of, of abstractions. In mythology, every abstract principle becomes an animal, a totemic ancestor, a human being, a human ancestor, or a divine being, or a divine ancestor. This comes from a book, uh, West African Religions. And so um, we gotta understand that when you're, when you're reading myths, myths are not science. They are hypotheses. And hypotheses are, uh, questions essentially questions uh, uh or they follow research questions and they are explanations that scientists intend to through experiment confirm or disconfirm uh by way of experimentation so just because one has a hypothesis and an explanation which a hypothesis is doesn't mean that it is it has been confirmed through a scientific process <laughs> and so we of course have to understand well, what science is and so according to the uh the the consensus of the national academy of sciences institute of medicine the use of evidence to construct testable explanations and predictions of natural phenomena as well as the knowledge generated through this process. And so it's about, as I stated earlier, testable, uh, it, 
explanations and predictions. So the, the hypotheses have to be testable. If you can't test the hypotheses, then it is not subject to scientific scrutiny. And so for those of us who, who are engaged in so-called religious debates, uh, especially with the Abrahamic traditions of Islam and Christianity, you know we have we go through this back and forth with them in, in terms of testable testable hypotheses, uh, which are testable explanations, uh, which seek to uh, give predictions as well. And so without the testability and the falsifiability of the hypotheses, we don't have science. <laughs> and so how does science work? Uh, and I know I'm repeating this, so I'm going to kind of read it fast. At least, you know, if you are watching this uh, later, you can pause it and read it uh, at your own pace. So scientific knowledge and understanding accumulate from the interplay of observation and explanation. Scientists gather information by observing the natural world and conducting experiments. They then propose how the systems being studied behave in general, basing their explanations on the data provided through their experiments and other observations. They test their explanations by conducting additional observations and experiments under different conditions. Other scientists confirm the observations independently and carry out additional studies that may lead to more sophisticated explanations and predictions about future observations and experiments. In these ways, scientists continually arrive at more accurate and more comprehensive explanations of particular aspects of nature. So, First and foremost, science involves a community of scientists from around the world. There's no such thing as an African science or a European science or an Asian science or an Antarctic science. There's only science and it's done by scientists whose personal ethnic backgrounds may have origins on in a particular region across the earth but science is science and this is something that people have to understand <laughs> and so here's a little representation of you know the, the the modern scientific method in terms of us having an observation in nature and then we propose a hypothesis we propose an explanation um and we make predictions then we test it and then we test it over again, modifying our hypotheses. If the, the testing confirms the hypothesis, um, we, we go on to the theory phase. But other scientists throughout this process will be testing your hypotheses. And each time you test your hypothesis, you introduce new variables uh, to change it up a bit so we can be precise in uh explaining the phenomena and again we're trying to eliminate chance as an explanation for the phenomena which we observe and so with with people for example who are like creationists they they do the opposite of what scientists do <laughs> and so the 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 scientists the modern scientists will say well here are the facts what conclusions can we draw from them? Whereas the creationist, the religionist person says, here's the conclusion, what facts can we find to support it? And so they don't go through a scientific process. They already made up their mind on what the conclusion is. So from that point, they start looking for quote unquote evidence to support their conclusions. And this type of attitude and approach to trying to explain stuff is ubiquitous across the earth. It has it, it is not relegated to a particular type of person, uh, excuse me, a particular type of ethnic group or language speaker. All people do this. And so, you know, science forces you to, to act and do things differently. And so we got to avoid trying to do things like this. And so uh, I love this quote by Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, who says the good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. And so when there's 
people wanting to um, associate science with their religion, which is uh, associated with a certain type of beliefs. Um, they think, for example, that you have to be initiated into some high priesthood, you know, in order to know and validate certain sciences. That's BS. Because when we're talking about science, we're talking about the, the observation and the description of natural laws. Whether you are initiated or not, whether you're white or not, whether you're black or not, the laws of the universe existed before human beings did. And so you can verify independently laws which govern the, the movement and evolution of reality independent on what any person believes. And so that is the goal of scientists. Regardless of whether you believe in gravity, the evidence of gravity exists. Whether you believe in the, the earth is flat or not, the evidence is overwhelming that it is not flat. If your religious tradition says that the earth is flat, we know that you have not conducted any scientific experiments. And so we got to distinguish between belief systems and science. <laughs> Another thing that we have to uh, avoid, hold on one second while I take a sip. One other thing that we have to avoid is this concept called concordism. Now, this may be a new word for a lot of you uh, listening. So concordism has to originally deal with um, uh, a debate between scientists and and creationists uh, of the Bible. And so um, there's a, a website, Biologos, where I, I, I got this uh, excerpt from. And so uh, as they explain, the word concordism is found in neither Merriam-Webster or the Oxford English Dictionary, yet it's often used in contemporary works dealing with origins, derived from the word concord, meaning a state of harmony. Concordism has been used sparingly in English for more than a century. However, its prominence today comes from a thoroughly scholarly book written shortly after World War II by the late Baptist theologian Bernard Ram, The Christian View of Science and Scripture. As Ram defined it, concordism seeks a harmony of, ge of the geological record in the days of Genesis, by which he really meant an old earth creationist approach. And so with how we got to understand concordism is when, when uh, a, a religious tradition tries to use modern scientific discoveries and try to retrofit them into their religious tradition, and try to make it seem as if the religious tradition is in fact explaining what modern science has come to discover. This is a logical fallacy. Um, and you know, a lot of people do this. They think they finding parallels between what uh, scientists have discovered in modern times and have uh, tried to uh, retrofit them into their religious beliefs, which did not come by way of a scientific process. And so continuing on that, and so remember that concordism first uh, becomes a concept dealing with the Bible, but now it's been applied to, you know, uh, beyond the Bible. So when you research the word concordism, if you put it in Google, probably the first three or four pages is going to deal primarily with the Bible. You're going to see Bible links come up. But um, from the same source, the Bible, so we live with the core tenets or assumptions of concordism. For example, the Bible and science, mainly geology and astronomy, are both 
reliable sources of knowledge about the origin of the earth and the universe. God has written two books for our instruction, the book of nature and the book of scripture. Since God is the author of both books, they must agree when properly interpreted. So you hear a whole bunch of people talking about, well, you got to understand it properly to see the scientific uh, explanation, you know, in um, this particular religious tradition. And so, uh, so the for for the for the biblical scholars who try to say that uh, the the Bible fits in with modern science, you know, they they argue, and I actually have a little chart that God. If we, if we can see this chart here, that God is the author of two books, um, the scripture, which you see on the left, and then uh, nature, which you see on the right. And so in between that, there's human uh, interpretation. And so, uh, so when we talk about the human interpretation, we're talking about theology for God's writing of the scripture. Main goal is to understand spiritual reality or science. Uh, excuse me, nature and human interpretation through science. Main goal is to understand physical reality. And so this is how they try to warp it and, and make it seem as if the scriptures are in fact explaining the science, um, but for a to try to explain it in a spiritual parallel. And so you have even African people trying to do this uh, with ancient Kemet, with with the Efa system, with um, with uh, any you know saying um, indigenous religious system dealing with chakras and all of that, they try to make it seem that the new scientific discoveries actually confirms, in fact, the the uh, religious hypotheses that we spoke of earlier that are, that are expressed in their myths, and so. We have to be careful when we're doing these types of analysis not to uh, do concordism. And so, you know, uh, study this concept. This is, you know, maybe a new concept for a lot of folks, but, you know, this is one of the things that we have to be careful of when we're having these types of discourses. Because when, when people try to say that African spirituality is science, they're in essence, doing concordism and so this is this is something that we have to be uh mindful of so <laughs> now in one of my facebook posts <laughs> in one of my facebook posts i said that science is a way of knowing by way of experimentation and testing is something that you do. And I said that spirituality, in fact, is an art. And a few folks on my Facebook page was all up in arms uh, thinking that I'm just talking out of my behind. So y'all should already know that, uh, at least by now, that I don't say anything just half-assed. <laughs> so, I'm going to deal with this concept of art. So, you know, we always got to start off with definitions. And so art, by way of, you know, the, the etymological evolution of the word art, is a skill, is a result of learning a, uh, or a practice from Latin artum, work of art, practical skill, a business, a craft, from Proto-Indo-European Aruti, source of the Sanskrit, rite, manner or mode. Artisan, to prepare. Suffix of the root R to fit together. Etymologically akin to Latin armor, weapons. So when something is an art, it is the manner or mode in which you do something. It is the way, it is, it is your ability to uh to learn a skill you know and so that's why you can have uh when, when when somebody goes through culinary school and they learn that art all they're doing is learning a skill 
It is a particular uh, practice, you know, um, that you are, are good at. It is not science. Art is not science. <laughs> so spirituality is art. It is a philosophy. Uh, I'm reading one of the comments. Someone saying spirituality is art. I like poetry and philosophy. So I like the sound of that. It's, it's, it's within the same vein. Um, and so we're going to get some African support of this. And so, um, but I want to first talk about what is spirituality. And so you first have to deal with uh, spirit. And so I'm going to exit real quick the presentation. And I'm going to get back. Uh, there we go. I'm going to get back to the video. <laughs> and so um, I didn't have time to type all of this out. So I'm just going to read, um, you know, saying from a text. And so I already have a video out uh, of me explaining what spirit is. So in short, spirit in African traditions is conceived in two ways. One as consciousness or thought or as energy in the universe, fundamental energy that, that, that governs and animates the universe. And so I'm gonna I'm read a few things from this text here. This is The Healing Wisdom of Africa by Dr. Maladoma Some, subtitled Finding Life Purpose Through Nature, Ritual, and Community. So hopefully y'all can see this and it's clear. All right. <laughs> so in this text, when, when was this published? So I can tell y'all the publishing date. Uh, this was 1998, copyright 1998. So, Somme 1998, we're going to start on page, what is this? I got the, I, I'm old school, so I like to fold the corners, you know, and it's, and it's blocking the numbers. So, you're not a real reader unless you fold your corners and you got markings and, and sticky notes, uh, you know, on your, on your pages. So that's how you can tell if somebody been reading a book if you go to their house. They ain't got no, no, no folded corners and all that. They ain't read that dang book. Anyway, so I'm gonna read <laughs> uh, a few things, you know, uh, and, and, and I may skip a, a, around. So I'll tell you when, when I skip around. So I'm gonna start uh, at the top of page 22. So, uh, and I'm gonna start with the word ritual. And so <laughs> Somme says that ritual is the technology that allows the manipulation of these subtle energies. Hold on, let me let me back up a bit. Uh on, healing is okay, so let me I'm a I'm going to go back to page 21 and I'm going to read that last sentence and I'm just going to read from the top. So they have also learned that the natural environment in which they live is made up of subtle, invisible things that if manipulated in a certain in certain ways can affect the conditions they intend to heal. So he's talking about healing and he's talking about indigenous people. So you're saying that um, they have the indigenous people have also learned that the natural environment in which they live is made up of subtle and visible things that if manipulated in certain ways can affect the conditions that they intend to heal. Ritual is the technology that allows the manipulation of these subtle energies. So I'm, I'm, I'm giving an, uh, a, a kind of lively explanation of what spirituality is. Is everybody's adding stuff into spirituality that has nothing to do with spirituality. Spirituality is a belief that you can manipulate 
subtle energies because spirit is energy in African traditions. We can we can go through this linguistically that they're talking about energy. And so it's the belief that you can use ritual to um, manipulate these energies. So community is important because there is an understanding that human beings are collectively oriented. The general health and well-being of the individual are connected to community and are not something that can be maintained alone or in a vacuum. Healing, ritual, and communities. These three elements are vitally linked. So I'm going to skip down to, uh, what is this? One, two, three, the third paragraph. And when he says, when we talk of ritual, so those of you who actually have the book and are trying to follow along, <laughs> when we talk of ritual here, we are talking about something much different, excuse me, much deeper. We are talking about the weaving of individual persons and in gifts into a community that interacts with the forces of the natural world. I'm going to skip over to the next page, page, what is this, 23, okay? Um, okay, I'm going to the second paragraph of that page. Indigenous people see the physical world as a reflection of a more complex, subtler, and more lasting yet invisible entity called energy. You keep hearing this word energy uh, resurface. It is as if we are shadows of a vibrant and endlessly resourceful, intelligent, dynamically involved in a, um, let me slow down. It is as if we are the shadows of a vibrant and endlessly resourceful intelligence dynamically involved in a process of continuous self-creation. Nothing happens here that did not begin in the unseen world. If something in the physical world is experience, experiencing instability, it is because its energetic correspondent has been experiencing instability. The indigenous understanding is that the material and physical problems that a person encounters are important only because they are energetic messages sent to the visible world. Therefore, people go to that unseen energetic place to try to repair whatever damage or disturbances are being done there, knowing that if things are healed there, things will be healed here. Ritual is the principal tool used to approach that unseen world in a way that will rearrange the structure of the physical world and bring about material transformation. So again, when we're talking about spirituality, there is the belief that under this physicality is a phenomenon called energy or spirit. The belief also is that we can, through ritual, manipulate the, the subtle forces of nature, the energy, and have an effect on the physical world. So ritual is essential to, um, to spirituality. And so uh, I like the way that he explains this. I can go anywhere in Africa and roughly get the same type of explanation. So we're just using him as a sample, um, as, as, a, as a benchmark to kind of understand other groups in Africa. Hold on. So now I'm going to skip to page... Um, hold on, let me, I don't want to go that far just yet. Um, hold on, let me, Okay, how did I lose that point? Now, I don't want to go there yet. I'm, I'm going to have to come back to this one point. 
Uh, oh, okay. So actually, uh, I, I skipped ahead, and I and I'm gonna go back. So we're gonna still stay on page twenty three. So I read that below where it talks about energy, but peep the word that he says here. So <laughs> in on page twenty three, in the first paragraph. So I'm gonna start where. He says, when villagers act together on their need for healing and engage in such spontaneous gestures, they are requesting the presence of the invisible forces and are participating with those forces in creating a harmony or symbiosis. This participation, excuse me, this partnership replenishes, replenishes each person by restoring his or her relationship to nature. For among indigenous people, the natural world and the spirit world are closely related, as we will see. Ritual is an art, an art that weaves and dances with symbols in helping to create that art rejuvenates participants. Everyone comes from a ritual feeling deeply transformed. Uh, this restoration is the healing that ritual is meant to provide again ritual is an art we've already established what art is art is not science and so the idea of manipulating these energies is done through ritual which is an art not science let me skip now, let me see. Because I mentioned earlier also um, in, in, the, in the Facebook post that, you know, using the word juju in replacement of spirituality, um, that, you know, juju is not going to help you against certain physical forces in this world and history has has demonstrated this time and time again and so um maladoma some to an extent acknowledges this and he says on page 29 or should i actually read from page 28 i'm gonna read the last sentence from uh, uh last sentence paragraph from um on page 28 and then i'm gonna go into page 29 so he says, but I have learned that there is many, there is in many Western people a strong resistance to joining community because of all the flaws apparent in the intentional communities they have seen. So he, he's talking about uh, this idealization of indigenous communities. So a lot of folks run around here thinking that uh, these, these indigenous ways are, are perfect and things of that nature. And he's here to tell you that, no, that's not the case. Um, and so because of all the flaws apparent in the intention of communities they have seen, part of this resistance stems perhaps from a disappointed idealism, a demand that a community be perfect. But in fact, an intentional community, which we would say indigenous community in the West is a place where people agree to work at becoming better connected to one another. Even indigenous communities, which we often praise, are far from being perfect. They certainly offer a great deal in the area of maintaining connection, both with other people and with the spirit and other world. But in their pursuit of the spirit, they may have forgotten to integrate it with matter. Hence their deprivation in terms of basic material necessities of life. So they're <laughs> already he's separating, understanding the, the, the needs and things of the physical world and their ideal and their dealing with the concept of spirit. And he's showing that they have been neglecting because they've been so spiritual that they have neglected the real world. And so in the real world, we use science 
to understand it and to create instruments and 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 processes that allow for us that that protect us from the elements and other groups and 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 allows for our economy to thrive but he's saying right here you know because we were dealing so much in the spirit world this world of subtle energies that we manipulate through the art of ritual that we have neglected the um the physical world the world of matter and so this is all i'm saying when i'm having these discussions on facebook which is why i push stem i'm not saying that you have to abandon spirituality but we need more scientists because we're so much in the spiritual that we are neglecting and losing battles and wars and things of this nature because we don't have a grasp on reality here and so he says people's resistance to the community in the west may also come from an undeveloped sin of personhood okay i can skip that so <clears throat> i just wanted to highlight that from um the text and so when when people you know uh try to separate certain things um or, or try to say that you know there there's science in the it's none of that and so now i'm gonna go back to the 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 slideshow presentation and so i'm gonna share again and so now i'm gonna go back here and do i want to go there well i guess i can go there so i'll, I'll go here so it's you know we, we got to have a discussion on what energy is oh how did i um, let me go. Um, let me go. So, so remember what we talk about art, a skill as a result of learning and practice. <laughs> and so when they, when we're talking about energy, you know, everyone knows the famous, uh, E equals MC square. Um, and so that is the, the, the famous formula that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared and so this is just a creative way that you see in terms of the uh the 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 creative way in which uh we we can understand this particular formula there's often a mistake that people think that energy and matter are equated but that's not quite correct energy and mass are properties of matter and mass uh we, we can equate energy and mass for example the when you when you when you put something in terms of the speed of light uh the speed of light is just used as a constant in in certain mathematical equations in physics and so if we put one as the as the number for the um uh, for the speed of light equation, you know, one squared is uh, just one. And so one time, whatever the mass is, is just gonna be the mass. And so this is how you know that energy equals mass. And so um, and so this is important when, when people are talking about manipulating matter and, and, excuse me, energy and things of this nature. And so if you are quote unquote manipulating energy, you cannot do that without manipulating matter. And so people think that they're doing science, but they're not because energy is a property of matter. So if I cook, if I transform um, uh, some, some food, uh, some raw food into a meal, by definition, technically I'm doing spirituality because I'm manipulating energies for some purpose or whatnot. And so people get religion, morality, ethics, character development, and spirituality uh, mixed up. And spirituality has nothing to do necessarily with ethics. Your ethics are to govern how you use spirituality, but energy is neutral. Matter is neutral. It is neither good nor bad. It's how you use it, you know, or what you can create with it. <laughs> And so, uh, 
you know, energy and mass and the speed of light are all properties of matter. Uh, electromagnetic energy is stored in the orbital structure. Um, I, I use this for a different lecture, uh, so I won't go through all of this. Um, and then, you know, you got to talk about energy at rest versus dynamic energy. And so you know, when you talk about E equals MC squared, you're talking about energy at rest. Um, and so, you know, when you have the delta in front of it, we're talking about the change in mass. And actually, the uh, the original, um, the the original equation in Einstein's paper, if you if you read it uh, from 1905 on general relativity, um, or was it special relativity from 1905? Anyway, uh, it is actually m or mass equals e over or divided by c squared and so that's the original formula and so there's a way that you you know do the math where certain things cancel out and then you get e equals mc squared but the original formula is actually m equals e over c squared that's just some random off topic stuff <laughs> and so i want to uh highlight this okay so i'm 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 not going to switch my screen at the moment but I, I want to switch to the congo to show that there's some continuity um across african uh countries as it regards this concept of of what spirit is in relationship to energy and all this other kind of stuff so um in the congo there is a phenomena called moyo and moyo by definition i'll use the chiluba as a, an example is a word for heart life spirit soul courage will desire purpose inclination feeling mood thought um and hello hi uh is used as a greeting so you, you're saying you're greeting someone with the heart or you're greeting someone with life and spirit. So you, you, you are transferring that on to someone else. But I'm going to read from this text by uh, Dr. Kimba, the late Dr. Kimba Dende Kia Bonseki Fukiao. Um, it's called Self-Healing Power and Therapy. Right. And so for those who have that book or don't, um, we're going to go to page 115 of that text. So on page 115, he gives the Kikongo uh, aspect of Moyo. And the Kikongo speakers, the Bakongo speakers, and the Chiluba speakers, they're all related folks. They're cousins. <laughs> and, and so as you can see, this word uh, is in the Isi Zulu language in South Africa. They say Umoya, and it is air, spirit, soul, wind, breath. So when we talk about spirit and and soul and wind, it, it is these are equivalents, like uh, like like the word spirit in English. So <laughs> the uh, the conceptual cognate. This is not a linguistic cognate. It's conceptually, you'll find the same word as ib in the ancient Egyptian language: heart, mind, wish, character, and some other meanings that uh, is associated with this. So, but anyway, going back to Fukiao. Fukiao says, Moyo, the last word in the definition of earth, according to the ancient schools of Africa, means vi vital power. This vital power, Moyo, came to exist on earth after the Futu was completely tied up. The Futu and its contents were ready to secure life to be born on earth. Moyo, in this language, Kikongo, is a universal matter. It is something both inside and outside. Moyo is what is the vitality of life. It is the key word to Kibantu, the Bantu way of life, their philosophy. Kimoyo, vitalism, is their religion, and it is not animism. When you talk about African religion, you're talking about the so-called manipulation of vital forces in nature by way of ritual as we we saw in the text of of uh maladoma some the healing wisdom of africa in another text on healing ironically going into the congo tradition we see the uh, essentially the same idea 
So they have the word for it, moyo, for the word for vital for vital power, and the word kimoyo as the word vitalism. And this is the word for religion. So <clears throat> yes, uh Julanda Zachary, they're 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 they they are related words. The word oya for, for wind and umoya, yes. And so it's actually a word, it's ultimately a word for heart. And but the heart in African languages, the word for heart and lung are connected. So when when you're dealing with the 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 heart lung connection, then you're dealing with breath and wind. So that's where that relationship comes from. There's another uh, set of relations dealing with blood and life. So that's why we have all these different definitions: heart, life, spirit, soul, courage, will, desire, purpose, inclination, feeling, thought, mood. So remember, in Africa, your mind is in your heart in your chest, inside your body or your stomach. It's not in your brain. It has to deal with your heart. And so there's different der semantic derivations from an essential root meaning heart. And so, um, so when we're talking about Kimoyo, we're talking about vitalism, of which the, the Westerners have mistaken as animism. And so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to exit the presentation and I'm going to go to Dr. Fukial's, uh, let me see. Actually, I should be able to, because I have it still up on this other screen. What page am I going to start? I'm going to go to page 133. Okay, so can y'all see my screen? Um, hold on. So, okay, so hopefully y'all can see the screen. Um, let me try to zoom in a little bit so y'all can see it a little better. Uh, okay, that is not the Zoom feature, so I'm, I'm looking crazy. Uh, let's go to 175. Let's hide you for a second. Okay, let's close this. I want to have as much screen as possible. Uh, you try to go 200%. Uh, is this better? Can y'all see uh, in terms of the size? Let me go 220. See if that works. So this is, I think, as safe as I can get. So uh, for those in the chat, you know, is this a good size for y'all to, to see the text? All right, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so now <laughs> I'm reading from um, I'm reading Doctor Fukial again, and but this time we're going to get a a greater expanse on what he is talking about, and so this is from Doctor Fukial's uh, PhD dissertation uh, called "Digging Up the Past." Uh, what's the full title? It's Digging up the past. Um, one second. So y'all can you know try to find this text yourself. Yeah, digging up the past: an approach to fundamental education and community development. The case of Zaire. Okay, <laughs> so you got to understand Kimoyo, religion, in. Uh, or spirituality, the religion, in a um, in a particular context, and uh, I, I want to give the context here, and so I'm going to be reading a little bit ahead of where I actually want to actually make the point. So bear with me 
as uh, uh, we go through this. So, so he explains, so he's going to give the, the general Bantu conceptualization of, of spirituality, uh, of conceptualizations of God, and how this concept of Moyo fits into this reality. So hopefully um, y'all understand it, and so, so bear with me. Okay. The Bantu concept of God is a principle of Kalunga, therefore the wielded opposite forces, positive and negative. In one, Banza Dia Kabantu, Mu Nzambi, Ini Kingu Wa Kalunga, therefore Wa Ngolo Zabundana, Zabundana, Kaleye Luvimba, Va Kimosi. The Muntu himself is seen in terms of their paired forces, Inkwa Luzungu. He is a being of paired organic forces. So we're talking about God as a principle of, of wielded opposite forces. So they're talking about God as a force. Kalunga is a force of positive and negative energy, essentially. And they're saying that the Muntu is also himself a, a, an entity of paired forces. Some are said Lumoso or Lukinto, left or female, and other Lunene or Luba, Lubakala, right or male, because all beings are resultant of the Kalunga, the complete forces made up of wielded opposite forces of Kala and Luvimba, positive and negative in one. So what he's saying is here is that human beings in all things are just aspects of the divine, of God. And just as God is made up of opposite wielding forces, all other beings are just reflections of these opposite wielded forces. Uh, let me scroll down a little bit. So as a matter of fact, the whole African religion, as one can see in their aspect among the Bantu people, have two key words beside in Zambi or Kalunga. So in Zambi is a word for God. Kalunga is another word for the same God. Um, and actually, as a preview for uh, my upcoming book, Galuja Volume 2, this word Kalunga is the word for Ra in the Kikongo language. Ka being the prefix Lunga is the, the cognate for Ra in, in Kikongo. And in Zambi is the con is the cognate for uh for Amen. And they actually combine the names in Zambi Kalunga in uh in Kikongo. And so it is the same as Amen Ra in uh Egyptian. Of course, I'll deal with that in the text. That's a whole different lesson. I'm just giving you some heads up. Okay, so these words are ngolo and moyo, force, energy or dynamism, and life, vitality. It is here that the African religions, in their aspect among the Bantu, find their roots of their dynamism in their wholeness. Instead of searching the sense and meaning of the Bantu aspects of African religions on this clear basis, the Eurocentrist scholars found it not only important, but imperative for their imperialistic intentions to label Bantu religion on the ground of a very negative basis. Yet this basis does not have tracks in the Bantu languages. They labeled these people animist and their religion animism. The word itself related to anima or animal says clearly what these scholars had in mind about African religion in general and about its aspects among the Bantu people in particular. The Bantu religion is not animism or animalism. Neither are the Bantu animists or animalists. The Bantu people are vitalists. This is accepting themselves as well as everything in the universe as part of Nkingu a Moyo the principle of life and its wholeness. Their religion deals principally with force and vitality, a religion that does not believe in any physical being, but in Ngolo, Yimoyo, Mudingo Dingo, 
force in life through dingo dingo the natural way of life and change so they're talking about evolution in a sense dingo dingo is a word that they use for change in evolution so we're talking about these opposite wielded forces of life through the process of change the natural way of life and change this religion can be called dynamo vitalism kimoyo and i gotta say something about this prefix key key is the prefix for the manner or way or art when you want to say words for art or manner or way you say you you put the key prefix in front of the word so when we talk about kimoyo we're talking about the manner or way or the art of vitalism just as Maladoma Somme talks about the ritual being art, here he's talking about uh, the by by the grammar of the language, kimoyo is the art of moyo of vitalism, the manner, the way of uh, of, of vitalism. The religion itself is not a question of belief; it is a question of ta dingo dingo yekala mu dingo dingo, participating in dingo dingo of change and being part of the dingo dingo the evolutions the the process of change the muntu the human being sees his religion like dancing dancing is not a question of belief it is a question of participating and of and of of being part of the dance this is why every muntu every uh every muntu african dances exactly in the same manner he talks and exalts his ngolo or moyo um let me scoot this over just a little bit the key words of his religion of force and vitality in which in zombie God is not a physical being of male or female gender. So we don't believe in God's in, in, in a way that God is a physical being. You know, it is just energy. It's an infinite energy that permeates infinitely. It is existence itself. So, um, is not a God is not a physical being of male or female gender, but a Kalunga god is so this is a description which when you talk about ra ra is a is a is an epithet for god ra is not god in ancient kemet or in in the congo so kalunga which is the principle of opposite wielded forces in one a principle that one can understand because inseparable with matter only in being part of the motion through dingo dingo itself let us be more specific and clear here According to Kibantu, which is the uh, Bantu philosophy, way of seeing things, thinking, being, accepting, or negating Bantu philosophy, such as one finds among the Congo, a Bantu cultural group well known to us, these opposite wielded or paired forces, Kala and Luvimba, do not exist separately in nature, societies or people. They do not separately exist as label to any particular good, positive, or bad, negative, known notion, society, or individual either. These forces are always found met. Za Kayangama, existing wielded in one, in nature as well as in Consul Machia in Simono, any element related to nature, in societies as well as uh, in individuals. The Congo people say that uh in each element of nature there is presence of masculinity and femininity therefore two wielded forces of different nature symbolizing birth and death kala and luvimba the same tongue that says inga yes can say no or ve and vice versa and yet the same tongue is servant to the same individual into which the pair concept of yes no is a token uh two sides in one these opposite wielded forces in each element of nature are responsible for the balance of nations, societies, individuals, nature itself, and the whole of the universe. It is according to African religion in this aspect among the Bantu that nature of Nzambi Kalunga, remember this is Amen Ra, God itself. Um, <laughs> Tonta mu vambisa ingolo zazi zole zayantungunsani i mu bunga enzayi kwabula Willing to isolate these opposite wielded forces is to blow up the whole world and to break the balance of the universe as a want to negate the dingo dingo of life. Inkinga, Inkingu, in Zambi, 
the African principle of God that will all that we all are the principle of life and change through the dingo dingo. You see, yeah. So I don't have to read that. So hopefully, what I'm what I'm saying is clear. <laughs> so when we when we understand that God is energy, is force, is power. It is a, it is infinite existing being. The spirituality is the ability to tap in via ritual these subtle energies that make up God and the universe itself, which is God. And so what they call this process, he says the word religion, um, and, and of course we would use spirituality, is that the spirituality or the religion for him is kimoyo, it is vitalism. And so it, it's this vitalism, it's, it's about the transferring of, of energy from um, one individual to another. And so now I'm gonna go back into the self-healing power and therapy book, Old Teachings from Africa, still on page, uh, what is this, 115. So he says, Moyo is not Luzingu, the material life. It is not Inzugulu, the, the way this material life is lived, or Zingu, its duration. Zingu is a word for time. All these three, Luzinga, life, in Zingula, living, and Zingu, biography, can only be made possible with Moyo, the vital power. One who believes in or accepts this notion of vital power is Inqua Moyo, or Inqua Kimoyo, a vitalist. So a, 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 a priest or a, a religious person who accepts the underlying vitality of life and believe that it can manipulate its forces as, is inqua. We would say unk in Egyptian, but inqua moyo, inqua kimoyo, a vitalist. A vitalist, inqua kimoyo, is an individual who believes in the art of regenerating power. It is an art, it is not science. As a human uh, healing process, dingo, dingo, excuse me, dingo, dingo, dia, in dia, casina, moyo. Oh, excuse me. Moyo is the power that makes things grow and be alive. Moyo as a universal matter is present in everything, even in rocks. The kind of moyo hidden in rocks, plants, and animals has a great role to play in man's moyo. And it is the main source of his medicine. And so you can deal with the forces, quote unquote, of nature and um and 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 moyo and energy and have no clue how it works and so it's not a deep study to discover laws it's just your interactions with life your harmony with life in these forces and so science although it deals with the same energy it is a different process they're simply trying to understand and to know the 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 what how and describing to create formulas to describe how nature works they're different things they can be used or they can be they can exist simultaneously within a culture but they're different things all together and so what i'm trying to get people to understand is that you know one's religion and one's spirituality is different from science it is re, re, spirituality is one's art. It is an art, it is not science. And we've read that from two different African sources here. And one of them um, is embedded in the grammar of the language. And so <laughs> from there, I want to switch, and I, and I don't want to take up too much time here. I'm going to switch now to to shaka zulu and the the zulu uh revolution so i had to scan in these pages so y'all gotta forgive me it's not a natural pdf um this is you you'll often hear me uh talk about 
this this text here, which is called Conflict of Minds um, by uh, the late Jordan Ingobani. And Jordan Ingobani is an is a Umuzulu from uh, from South Africa. And he was writing during the time of apartheid. And this book here is to demonstrate or to articulate why there is a conflict between essentially overall um, Africans and Europeans, but more specifically Europeans and uh, South African uh, Bantu speakers. And, and what he argues is that the worldviews uh, are so different and how they see the world and their attitudes that it is uh that it, it is a source of conflict between the two groups and so excuse me and so in this aspect of the text he's talking about the zulu uh history and in an understanding of reality and so he's giving you the, the Zulu worldview so you can better understand how they maneuver and uh, operate, you know, in the world. And it has some, it, it, it is, you know, you got to understand the people's cosmology and worldview first before you can really kind of understand their history because their worldview shapes their behavior. And, um, as a result of that, we get the certain type of historical events that we have. And so um, with that said, you know, the, the worldview of the Zulu people is what helps shape the behavior of Tashaka Zulu himself. And so one of the things that I argued at the beginning of this uh, conversation is that, you know, African people are not one people. We're, we're all related as homo sapiens sapiens, but all African people are not the same. We may have related languages, we have, may have common customs, but not all groups are the same. We all mature and know different things. Uh, we mature uh, uh, socially differently at different times at different paces. It is, it is erroneous to speak of, about an African religion in the singular or an African culture in the singular. Because all, all somebody has to do is find one African group that indigenously operates in a different way in which you say is African and your whole thesis is null and void. So you never speak in absolutes as a researcher. You, you, you always give a proper context. And so if it is a small number, you say it's a small number. If it's a great number, you say it's a great number. But you never say all, you never say African religion. You never say, uh uh african spirituality because you'll you'll always be wrong and so um <clears throat> so hopefully y'all can see i'm going to have to expand it a little more uh so y'all can read so let me do that and boom so, and I'll be skipping around, so I'm not going to read all of this stuff. And so, uh, I, I just want to show y'all that there's there's some symmetry between what we read among the, the Dagara people in West Africa, the uh, Kikongo speakers in Central uh, Africa, and now with the Zulus in Southern Africa. And so, uh, he discusses this concept of their concept of god so i'm just going to read from this paragraph right here starting with where and so he does comparisons with ancient egyptian and he finds uh correlations between ancient egyptian uh philosophy and bantu philosophy and so so you'll hear him mention these things so um he says where the ancients believe that all phenomena emerged from new so we're talking about the nun in ancient kemet which was primordial matter where the chain of evolution began with new 
and proceeded to the waters of antiquity, new, the original mound of earth, new, the creator God from whom all things evolved, the lesser gods and the person, the section of the Nguni from which the Zulus descended, believed that all phenomena had their origins in a living reality or consciousness, which they called Ukobo. This reality had no beginning and no end. It was alive and existed from eternity to eternity. Each phenomena had its Ukobo, reality or value. So this word Ukobo means um, reality or value, but also truth. It is cognate with the word Ma'at. I know it doesn't seem that way, but in the upcoming text, I will demonstrate how this is the case. But just, just bear with me right now that this word Ukobo is cognate with the word Ma'at in, in ancient Kemet. This reality uh, had no beginning and no end. It was alive and existed from eternity to eternity. Each phenomena had its Ukobo, reality or value which was an integral part of the infinite value, which was ukobo lokobo, value which is a portion of value. So understand what he's saying here. So remember what Fukial said, that that Kalunga, or in zombie God, in his title Kalunga, is an, an infinite energy force, or, or, uh, or is, a, is, is a power of opposite wielding forces. And that the human being itself is also an entity of opposite wielding forces because it is a portion of Kalunga itself. So you're seeing this continuity here. We have an infinite uh, conceptualization of God as a consciousness or reality or entity of force. And that all of creation exists inside the infinity. And that the human being is divine by the very essence of the nature of, you know, being a part of the infinity. So th um, this person evolved from this value in response to the law of appearing. Um theta way velo. That word in velo is cognate with the word keper in Egyptian. And um theta is, is cognate with the word medu. So this would be Medu Keper instead of Medu Necher, Medu Keper. <laughs> if we was to translate this in Egyptian, Medu Keter, Keper. Or demands of his nature, Isimo. Or perpetual evolution, Ukuma Injalo. His destiny was forever to evolve and discover more satisfying dimensions of being, of being, Ukuba Ingomuntu. So it's a being of human, actually. So this word Muntu, Ingamuntu of being human. So um, to discover, so he's always evolving. So we're talking about evolution here. It's always evolving. This 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 value, this of Kobo, is just an evolution in the interaction of opposite wielding forces, which the human being itself is a, a value. It is also Ma'at, it's, it's its own uh, entity, its own energy force. These pronouncements on origins, nature, and destiny of the person exist in Izaga, aphorisms, and, and form an important section of the law of being human, which issues from the law of appearing. So you got to understand, uh, matter of fact, he explains it better than I, so I'll, I'll keep reading. Each phenomena was a cluster of smaller values. All phenomena were alive because the infinite Ukobo was alive. All phenomena existed inside Ukobo because there was nothing outside of it. So remember that Ukobo is infinite. You can't exist outside of infinity. So you cannot, God could not create, according to the Zulu, ex nihilo. Like God is an entity of itself and then it commanded and existed somewhere else creation. God is existence. God is reality. That's what this word means. And so the ancient Nguni referred to the perspective from which they viewed the cosmic experience as untheto, the law. And, and the words for law, is it comes from a word for uh, command, um, speech. What the ancient Greeks called philosophy was known among the Nguni as the law. This law was passed down from generation to generation and exists today in its pure form in Izaga. 
The five main sections of philosophy, I'll skip that. The central teachings of Ubuntu. Okay. The central teachings of Ubuntu is that all things originate from Ukobo and evolve in response to the challenge of their nature. So we're talking about the pressures of nature, uh, of its environment. So everything evolves based on the pressures of its environment. Natural selection, we would say uh, today in, in modern um, scientific language that the person is a self-defining value. So we are energy, we are, we are, own, we are Lukobo, a smaller value of the greater Ukobo, but what makes us different is that we self-define ourselves as human beings. So all other entities that we know of in the universe can be defined, but it is the human being that actually defines itself. So that person is a self-defining value. Umuntu ingumuntu. Umzimba uziwa ingumuniwo. That is, the person is human. It is the person who knows best the workings of his body and its life's purpose for the uh, person in perpetual evolution. Let me see uh, if I want to read where I want to go. Because again, I don't want to read all of this. I just want to get to certain points. Perpetual evolution. I'm just looking at my notes right here. Uh, ancient Guru perspective is the view of the cosmic experience. As in there, I got that. There are values of themselves. There are self dividing values. Got that. That the, the law of appearing. Got that. One of the functions of the mind of the person of the gnomes and nation was to translate. Okay. So let me. Uh, let me let me see. Um, let me. Oh, let me just. I forgot that I have the book and I have certain things highlighted in my book. I got the physical copy from which I made the scans. So hold on one sec. Uh, hope y'all doing all right over there. Okay, so what I'm going to do is read. Okay, uh, I'm going to scroll down to customs, the word customs. There we go, right here. It said, uh, so customs, laws, and other legal usages were part of the self-definition on one plane, on another. They were expressions of the law of appearing in different environments. One of the functions of the mind of the person or the gnome or the nation was to translate Ukobo's law of appearing into social law and action. So what we understood of the law, the job of the community was to translate the law into social action and, and taboos and things of that nature, social laws. The customs, laws, traditions, and other usages gave structure to society. They were its constitution. The function of the constitution was to create, regulate, and perpetuate a social order in which the person could realize the promise of being human and the glory of being a self-defining value. This was Ukuba Ingumun, what Ukuba Ingumuntu meant. Hold on. Um, do, 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 do. Um, okay. Let me see the Zulus. Doo, 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 doo. Okay. Oh, okay. So hold on one second. I'm going to go to this, the next page, which is just over here. And we should be right in the mix. So hopefully y'all still with me. I'm not looking at the chat, but uh, so hopefully this comes up. So Okay, so we're going to go to the Zulus coupled right here. So, and, and I know it's going to seem patchy, but, you know, hopefully, again, y'all can pause uh, this 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 video and, and read these things, you know, uh, on your own. So, uh, and to Brother Eni uh, Herit Kafani, um, yeah, this, this book is out of print. So it's, it's going to be very, very hard to find. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, so he says the Zulus, 
coupled the ancient aphorism Umuntu Ingamuntu with Umuntu Akalahawa. The person is never so evil, he is beyond redemption. The Zulu speaking nomarchies of antiquity believed that all things had their origin in Ukobo. Everything in the cosmic order evolved from Ukobo. This Ukobo was primordial consciousness. So remember what I said when I talk about uh, spirit earlier. Spirit in African um, um, religious traditions is energy or consciousness. They're, 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 those are the two aspects of uh, definitions or associations of the concept of spirit in, in African uh, languages uh, for the most part. That's the consensus. Uh, so this Ukobo was primordial consciousness. It had no beginning and no end. It was the infinite total of the values of all things which together made the cosmic order. Ukobo was forever forming clusters of itself and combining these to produce phenomena. The agmination, and the word agmination simply means uh, clustering. It means to cluster, or it comes from a root meaning to cluster. So an agmination is a cluster. The, the agmination was regulated by Umtheta Wemvelo, the law of appearing, or Medu Keper, the law of appearing. Since Ukobo, the consciousness was alive and there was no death in it, since it was an infinity, human behavior in all of its forms on every plane and in all situations translated the law into action. Nothing on earth or in the cosmic order could violate the law, for the violation was itself an expression of the law. This is very important. And if you saw my book, you would see this is highlighted because you see these people in, for example, talking about a, a violation of natural law. You can never violate a law ever. What seems to be a violation is itself an expression of the law. And so we have to be careful of the kind of language that we use. So you, you can see the dichotomy here between, for example, the, the Zulu worldview and the uh, ancient, uh, uh, or excuse me, the present uh, Christian, Hebrew, and Judaic worldview, because they set it up as if people could possibly violate the laws of God. And as we can see in this worldview, that's impossible. So the violation, the so called what we perceive as a violation of, of the law, is simply um, uh, an aspect of the law itself. So you can never violate the law. So anyway, when persons knew the law, they did not fall into error. They did not hurt their neighbors. They developed the dimension of consanguinity, um, which enabled the person to regard his neighbor as the reverse side. Um, so uh, someone said the law of God, the, the Zulu would say the law is God. It is the, the, the regulating force of consciousness. You know, everything, there's, there's nothing that is not God. God is existence itself. So anyway, so the phenomenon to which he, the human person, was the upverse. His neighbor was all mankind. Ignorance was the person's only enemy. Ignorance was inadequate knowledge of the law. It pushed persons into error and forced them to do evil things. So what he's saying here is that a... Uh, to... Uh, uh, and, and he'll say this a little later, later that uh, virtue is the knowledge of the law. But an ignorant, an ignorant person is one who is ignorant of the law, of how the universal laws work. And so I'm, I'm, I'm citing this because they have the framework for science among the Zulu. And, and we're going to see how this understanding shaped the Shaka revolution. So the, the laws, trying to understand the laws of the universe, that is where science comes in to help us to understand the laws. You know, acknowledging that the laws are there is not science, but the, the, the process for trying to understand the laws itself is science. And so what they're saying is that an intelligent person a virtuous person is one who is knowledgeable about the law. And when you're knowledgeable about the law, uh, what do we say in English? When you know better, you do better. And so when people don't know better, that's because they don't know the law. They don't know how universal laws uh, 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 affect, you know, uh, as a result of their actions, they don't understand how the law um, uh, works and which is clear. 
So uh, let me skip down to where does he say this? He said the Zulu law, and I'm just going to raise it up just a little bit more. Uh, excuse me. The Zulu law, which was an extension of the law, drew the distinction between guilt and culpability and sought to focus such as much on the person's willful desire to remain ignorant. And so, you know, all these people with these pseudo attitudes, they just they just uh, have a willful desire to remain ignorant and lead an evil life. So when we talk about evil, evil is ignorance of the law, according to the Zulu. Um, to lead an evil life as on his so as on his society's failure to equip uh, and enable him to be the best that he could be, that he had a mini city in mind was proof that he could be a better human being. He could not in this setting be so wicked as to be beyond redemption. The person was neither good nor evil and everything he did, he responded to the inner necessity which inherited in his nature. He became a person of virtue, umuntu ofundiswe umtheto, the person who has been trained in the law or into ingamthethu, the thing which is without the law. Notice the wording that, uh, that he uses here. He says, he became a person of virtue, umuntu, the word umuntu is a word for human. Ofudiswa umtheto, the person who has been trained, ufudiswa trained in the law. So you're a virtuous person, you are a human being if you're trained in the law. But, or you are considered into inga, inga nam detho, that thing which is without law. You no longer are human. If you don't have knowledge of universal law and the consequence of your actions, you are not considered a human being, you are a thing. That into word, this, this into word means thing. And so that's a very important distinction, uh, depending on how he proclaimed his nature or defined himself. So now, uh, let me see. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, so now I'm gonna skip down. Okay, um, hopefully I don't have to read this because you got to understand this in general. So we're going to, you know, I'm just, we're going to read it. So let me, let me get busy. So uh, hopefully you have some time. I'm, I'm trying not to go past one o'clock. So I know I was late. So we really got started around 11 o'clock. So, you know, we got uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, hopefully we won't go that long, but um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, all of this comes into shape. In, into form so you know hopefully this is on the screen correctly uh cool beans all righty so when we're talking about the tashaka revolution he set in motion a new way in how to in, a new way in state formation we all know from tashaka zulu that he created and developed some very uh unique um how should i say uh methods of warfare but shaka zulu was is is actually greater than the warfare that he is known for and so uh so this kind of gives you a historical context you know of of the history of uh to shaka zulu and i have some other texts that back up this text but I'm not going to go through them. I'll save them for if, you know, people want to debate this issue. And so, of course, I always have sources upon sources upon sources. That's how we do it um, here in this place. So he says um, a new ideal of nationhood. The shift in the position of the Earth's poles produced cataclysmic changes in the Sudanic or the Sudic societies. So it, he calls basically all of the black African uh, groups Sudic people after the word Sudan. So when you see this word Sudic here, that's what he's saying. He, he's, he's, he's basically lumping Africans. Instead of saying Africans, he's saying Sudic. 
So the black African people, the stereotypical African people, he's calling the suited uh, folks. So, so what he's saying here is the shift in the positions of the Earth's poles produced classic cosmic changes in the Sudic societies. Large numbers of African communities were forced to immigrate from their ancestral lands and settle in other parts of the continent. So if you if you actually read Dr. Chancellor Williams, uh, The Destruction of Black Civilization, he talks about how the, the, the climate change in Africa was a major catalyst for all of the migrations in Africa in more recent times. So we know that that happened as a result of the poles, the the, the magnetic poles shifting um, in through throughout, you know, saying within the last uh, 5,000 to, uh, excuse me, 8,500 to uh, uh, 5,000 years. So um, the Sudic isn't referring specifically to the Sudanese as in just the Sudan in general. It's just a general uh word that he's using in replace of the word african so he's saying sudic so just how like the greeks use the word libyans or ethiopians to refer to all africans he's using the word Sud sudan or sudic to refer to black african people so i hope that makes sense uh to uh julanda zachary in the chat room okay so the largest of these communities were the bantu the descendants of the Intu or nu these moved in a southern direction. The Kosa, who liked the Zulu in Ponda, Swazi, and Baca, were members of the Nguni family and spoke mutually intelligible languages, spearheaded the southward migration. They were, for this reason, isolated from the larger Bantu communities, fleeing from the desiccated Saharan tablelands. Largely because of this isolation, they retained some ancient Nguni words and expressions. So he's, and I have some other sources that backs up what he says here. The ancient Bantu people actually lived in the Sahara. And so when we talk about the Bantu expansion, the Bantu expansion happened as a result of, of the, the, the drying of the Sahara. So when the, when the people in the Sahara were moving out, you know, from 5,500 BCE to about 3,500 BCE, a great number of the Bantu groups moved south through the rainforest and migrated in these different parts in Central Africa and, and, and other parts of East Africa, moving all the way down into Southern Africa. And so some of these Bantu people moved into ancient Kemet. I'll discuss this more in the next book, but here's one of the sources and, 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 and we can back this up with, with other um, uh, testimony and some things. So, all right. So, so uh okay let me go down and over uh, this way so we're on page 82 now so uh words which other nguni languages groups drop from their vocabularies the relevant expression found in kosa today is the description first of the coastal community and second of mankind umzi ka into or the family of into the nguni were not the only Sudic people who reached South Africa. The Soto language group, which includes the Soto, Swana, and Petty, was among the people from beyond South Africa. Smaller language groups like Venda and Tonga also settled in, in South Africa. The southward migration must have stretched over thousands of years if the evolution of the different languages of Black South Africa is any guide. The Nguni and Soto pushed the Batwa and Khoikhoi further south and settled on the lands they conquered. The Kosa people always had the freedom. See, this is key. I hope y'all paying attention to what I'm saying here. The Kosa always had the freedom to move to the new lands in response to population pressures, while the Zulu who settled in Natal were trapped between the Indian Ocean and the Drakensberg Mountains on the east and in the west between the Kosa and the south, and the Soto speaking communities in the north. The different positions of the Kosa and Zulu forced them to develop different political institutions in their efforts to create satisfying Sudic societies. The bias for agmination, for clustering or grouping, and the dimension of consanguinity preserved the autonomy of the different Kosa gnomes. 
if a nomarch broke away from his main cultural group, he could settle further south where he could keep in purity the principles of his interpretation of the Sudic ideal and preserve the autonomy of his known. A different situation existed among the Zulu speaking people. The circumstances of being trapped gave to the bias for admonition and the dimension of consanguinity, the character of threats to nomark, to the nomark uh, autonomy. As the population increased over thousands of years, nomarchic overcrowding created hunger for living space. Nomarchic tensions and wars were more or less become the order of the day. Let me stop here and 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 uh, explain something here real quick. So remember what he said. The, the desertification of the Sahara pushed the Bantu who were coming from uh, the Sahara into Central Africa and, and, and they, they some settled in Central Africa and some continued to move down south. Now, uh, <coughs> excuse me, as a result of this moving down south, different Bantu groups settled in different areas in South Africa. Where the Kosa settled, it was an abundance of land. However, where the Zulu people and some other uh, of the Nguni speaking groups settled in Natal, and you have to look up Natal so you can on, on, on a Google map so you can see what we're talking about here. It's in between some mountains and the Indian Ocean. So they're trapped, in essence, um, in kind of a bottleneck in that area and so what he doesn't explain here is that but from other sources there was also droughts in things that happened in southern africa and as a result of these droughts in southern africa it it caused tensions and it caused um a a a, a scramble and a fight for resources in southern africa and so now all of these related communities were now fighting amongst each other, you know, from the 1600s, 1700s, and even going into the 1800s, amongst each other for land and resources. They were in conflicts with each other. So um, when you understand that, now we can continue on with the reading. So our main source of information on these developments is still the body of pan. Pan, panegyric poems or the patronymic legends in other words the oral traditions from the um from the poets um, which were attached as titles to each family name these poems which describe the exploits of distinguished ancestors were passed from generation to generation because in them each family defined itself stated its interpretation of the Sudic ideal and preserved its identity and uniqueness if a person with a family name Ingubani handed over something to his neighbor, the latter would ex uh, express his thanks by reciting uh, Ingubani uh, patronymic legend. And so, oh, I got a, it's not a straight uh, PDF, I got to move over. So, in your disdain for your enemies, you crushed uh, people and their cattle. The skeletons tell the story. Most of the poems describe a golden age in the experience of the Zulu, uh, excuse me, of the, excuse me, of the experience of the Zulu, an age when warrior heroes strode the land and achieved the impossible. Warrior heroes come to the fore in conditions of social and political turbulence. And so uh, I'm actually gonna skip down. I'm not gonna read all of this. Um, and so because of the conflicts, and so we're going to go to this paragraph here. Because of the conflicts that we mentioned earlier, the most powerful princes set out to impose their own solutions on the Natal Nguni. Powerless as Malandela was, he nursed the ambition that one day he might have a son who would lead his people to the heavens, who would restore order in Natal. So because of the centuries-old conflicts between the people, the, the the people kept calling out, you know, basically for a hero to to bring peace among the people. And so Malandela, uh, you know, tried his hand at it, but he failed. And so people didn't want to give up their sovereignty. 
they didn't want to work together and people just wanted to 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 fight and 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 be in conflict and not all these fights were actually bloody you know war conflicts so another source actually gives the details of some of these types of conflicts but conflicts nonetheless sometime during the second half of the 15th century one of Mandela's wives gave birth to a baby boy Mandela was convinced that the boy would uh was the leader uh who could bring peace to natal and led the zulu speaking gnomes along safer routes to a better future to ensure that the boy lived and achieved as expected Malandela gave him the name zulu zulu ka Malandela zulu did not live up to the expectation so he was a weak leader um and turbulence did not subside by the 18th century a power vacuum had developed which each of the major princes tried to fill by asserting vigorous hegemon hegemonistic initiatives each prince or princelet employed one or more of the best educated poets in his known to chronicle events the court poet composed a long poem in honor of the prince tradition vested him with the authority of an oracle a voice of destiny he could say things in public which nobody could utter he could criticize the prince freely in his compositions at the same time he could form opinion and influence it in any given direction so zinza konaka jama zulu was an 18th century successor to zulu ka malandela zulu like most of his predecessors he too was he was too involved in questions of survival to bother much about conquest or considerations of destiny his court poet however was determined forever to confront him with the call of destiny the poet was under a new type of pressure the zulu who were best educated in the culture had begun to reject the idea that conditions could be stabilized by a strong prince so keep all this in mind they have been going through uh probably a century or two full of conflicts and each time they have relied on a, a strong prince to bring uh peace but uh this was failing so now attitudes are beginning to change you know uh and 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 so he's he's giving this context here so the poet was under a new type of pressure the zulu who were best educated in their culture had begun to reject the idea that conditions could be stabilized by a strong prince they saw salvation in an ideal nationhood which would not be associated with the family of any ruling prince there was a lot of inequality in early zulu nation and so the way that the society was structured added to the actual um poverty of the early zulu people and so with the with already scarce resources the princes were gathering all of the the resources for themselves while the people were in fact starving and some other things so they were growing weary of the uh, of not only the priesthood but um just the, how the state was structured unto itself an idea which would unite because it uh let me skip over here uh was seen to produce the desired results an idea which evokes similar and coordinable responses to similar challenges and so the court poet to Zanzankona enunciated the ideal in these terms raise me from the depths to the heights take me that which grain i may return the grain i shall winnow the grain i shall cook should you do that o indaba they sh will forever preach to each other about it the foes will so will those on our side a court of destiny let us weave o menzi sky of jama that to universes beyond the reach of spirit forms we may ascend so long must the cord be the spirit forms themselves will break their tiny toes should they dare to climb and so already you seeing them starting to 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 question the validity and the power of spirit forms they're they're, they're starting to reject aspects of the historical uh, uh religion or spiritual tradition and so the people who to whom the court poet addressed himself needed no extraordinary powers of imagination to understand the message they believed that they were incarnations of eternal values and that the eternal in them was real and positive to all things that it could do whatever it imagined since perpetual evolution was its destiny it had the power to traverse space and move from one universe to another to the endeavor the more far more satisfying dimensions of being human and so now we're going to get into the 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 coming of Tashaka Zulu. 
So let me uh, let me skip this page. Uh, yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna get into what I posted on Facebook. So this is the page that I posted on Facebook, page eighty-five, and says, "So uh, the person had all the future before him to evolve perpetually." Hold on, let me. The okay, so the poet told them that they needed no props to respond to the call of destiny. They needed no gods. Their ancestral spirits could not reach the heights of achievement which the person could. You're seeing they're evolving intellectually in, in as it regards the 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 role of the gods and the ancestral spirits in in shaping their destiny so they they are advancing intellectually on this front and this this is one of the reasons why i love and respect the zulu people very greatly um the disciplined self could imagine all things achieve all things and rise to the heights because he was human. It's all about being human first. All the person needed to do was awaken the powers locked in him. Excuse me. All the person needed to do was awaken the powers locked in him, was to have faith in the person, to discipline himself and to pro proceed from this to explore himself, to search the eternal microcosm that he was for satisfying dimensions of being human. The person had all the future before him to evolve perpetually into the type of human being he wanted to be. Society and the spirit forms were his allies and supporters. They were always ready to reinforce him whenever uh, he disciplined himself and marched to a clearly stated goal. The assumption behind this approach was that the person was adequate, that he had in him all the powers he could need to realize the destiny uh, he chose for himself. These powers inhered in him as a person he did not receive from any source outside of himself. So instead of relying on spirits and gods, rely on your sales, people. You have the intellectual capacity. You have the power. You are an aspect of God itself. So you don't need spirit forces to shape the reality of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, excuse me, how you see fit. So you're seeing this, this, this idea evolve. That's why I have to tell everybody that everybody in Africa is not the same. Everybody don't have the same beliefs. There are people in Africa still who believe that, you know, we can only move forward with the permission of gods and goddesses. The Yoruba people are one. The Akan people are another. You know, um, but then there are other people like the Bakongo and the Zulu who don't have that uh, ideology. They're different people. They have different worldviews. And so, you know, you're seeing this in this time. So I'm, I'm going to keep reading. So hopefully y'all are, are still with me. Y'all still rocking with me. And 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 I'm not being too, uh, you know, uh, boring with the reading, you know, so to speak. So, again, you can pause this when it's uh, uh, done so you can read it for yourself if you don't have the book. So these are scan images from the book itself. So... <laughs> Any belief in, ex in an external power was superstition, and superstition was the person's mortal foe. So they're evolving. They're like, uh, you know, this belief in external powers and coming and intervening is, 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 was the person's mortal foe. It's your internal enemy. So Shaka killed groups of diviners and witch doctors in the effort to free his people from the grip of superstition. He wanted a nation of truly free men and women who needed no props outside of themselves in order to realize the promise of being human. The Zulus were not the only people who regarded themselves as the people whose destiny was to traverse the universes. In Rhodesia, there were the, Mazez the Mazizuru, the people who belonged to the heavens. So an, uh, uh, a related people with, the, with a similar name. Shaka the Great was the son of Sinzain Zagokona. I'm saying this all wrong. Sinzakona. Sinzakon. I'm going to get this. And I'm, I'm one of these days. I need some of my Zulu people to help me with this because I don't know where the, the boundaries are. So I would say Sinzakona. 
So I, we'll, we'll just say that for now. Anyway, he adopted the court poet's ideal as the main inspiration of the revolution, which he led after his father's death. So the cosmology played a role in the, the, the Shaka revolution. It was the ideological blueprint on which he built the Zulu nation. But the revolution must be seen in context. The Zulu philosophers whose thinking was reflected in the new ideal of nationhood had evolved out of the stage when they were dependent on religion for guidance on the establishment of a better society. So the old Zulu, you know, the old court poets and things of this nature, they kept, you know, trying to find solutions based on their old religion. And so, um, so you had to be uh, dependent on the gods and goddesses, the spirit forces, in order to, to uh, realize peace in your society. And, and so this is what he's saying here, to establish a better society. Nom Kumbulunwana, the princess of heaven, was the last of their deities. So when you actually, when you go across the Bantu world, you rarely hear about gods and goddesses. They don't deal with gods and goddesses for the most part amongst Bantu speakers. They deal with the aspects of, of, of nature in a more scientific way. But that's not the case among like the Zulu, excuse me, the, the Yoruba people, the ancient Egyptians. Uh, and it depends on what context of the ancient Egyptians, you know, the icon and, 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 and like the dagger, you know, they, they believe in the spirit forces that, that come and intervene on your behalf. Uh, I think some of the Monday people believe this as well. <laughs> so religion had been alive. Excuse me. Uh, I'm messing up here. Where am I? Okay, here we go. Religion had been alive in a thousand years before Shaka. In all these years, it failed to resolve the conflicts in the Tao. It forced men to see it as a prop, a prison of the mind. So he, re he, he recates, he equates with uh, the, the early religion or, or spiritual tradition as a, uh, as a prison of the mind. It forced men to see it as a prop, a prison of the mind, which was used by the strong to entrench their power and not to solve the problems of suffering humanity. So people were using religion as a way to gain power, but not solve problems. <laughs> so, um, Shaka sailed into the situation and preached that whatever human beings were oppressed, they were in the final analysis oppressed by consent. And for those who remember my post on Facebook, I had this highlighted. Shaka sailed into the situation and preached that wherever human beings were oppressed, they were in the final analysis oppressed by consent. This is exactly what um, Kanye West was talking about. When he talks about, you know, uh, 400 years of slavery, that sounds like a choice. Shaka Zulu said the same thing, that ultimately in the final analysis, oppressed, excuse me, with, uh, wherever human beings were oppressed, they were oppressed by consent. This person had a mini ciliate mind which could traverse space and, and move from universe to universe and transform a human being into a conscious citizen of the cosmic order. This is just a poetic way to say that a human being has an intellect, he has a mind, and that uh, his imagination and his intellect will take him farther than the spirits or God's will. And that we have to rely on our minds to move us forward. This meant that if the person was prepared to impose certain disciplines on himself, he could become the creator of his own destiny. So when you discipline yourself to study and understand reality the way it is, you can move farther than anybody who is, who, who is uh, simply uh, uh, relying on religion and spirit forms. So... Uh, trying to see if uh, okay uh i'll read this last page and this is going to be it for us so <laughs> using his mind to traverse the, the the heavens 
in search of more satisfying dimensions of being human was the challenge of being a self-defining value. So to be a human being, the challenge of being human is how to strengthen your mind. Point was given to, to the challenge by the Zulu interpretation of the Sudic idea, which taught that the person had entered this earth as an act of choice, that his purpose in entering it was to discover more satisfying dimensions of Ukuba Ingomuntu, being human. The quest was to was the commitment for which he lived. It shaped his thinking, motivated behavior, and, and inspired action. To be human was its own reward. The person could not look outside of himself for a reward for realizing the promise of being human. He and he alone had chosen to enter the earth. He was the author of his mandate for existence on it. Perpetual evolution is the Sudic ideal taught, was the destiny of both the person and the cosmic order. Evolution is the order of the day amongst the Zulus. My grandmother on my mother's side who had served in King Sesuayo's, uh, I'll, I'll skip that uh, part. That's not uh, important for him. Um, so now here's the important part. The Zulu and Guni philosophers whose teachings the court poet preserved for posterity in his ideal had not reached negatively to the, re let me slow down and, and, and say this uh, properly. The Zulu and Guni philosophers, whose teachings the court poet preserved for posterity, in his ideal had not reacted negatively to the religious experience. They had simply outgrown it when it ceased to have valid meaning in their lives. To do this was to respond to the challenge of being human, to the call of perpetual evolution. So what they're saying here is that Change is the order of the day. Change, evolution is the order of the day. So things are not going to be the same way that they were in the past. So if you continue to try to use old solutions to solve new problems, you will forever be in a state of conflict and unrest. The person, the community, the society must evolve and adapt along with the uh, the current situations. And so in this particular instance, he was saying that the, the court poet did not react negatively to the religious experience. However, they had simply outgrown it when it ceased to have a valid meaning in their lives, meaning they weren't stuck on the religion. So they, they, they realized that they had to move forward and we can't keep these old ideas. That's why Shaka Zulu did what he did. And so, you know, the rest of the text tells you the, the, the philosophy which uh, shaped the, the Zulu nation and things of that nature. So we won't get into that. I just wanted to end there so that people can understand what is going on here. So with you, you see the evolution here of them expanding beyond um the gods and goddesses so to speak and 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 wishing that they intervene on our behalf and and having to do divinations you know to get uh to see if the 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 spirit forms give us permission to move forward in life and so you are your savior and you must you must expand your mind and 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 solve your own problems lean on your brothers and sisters create community create an environment that allows for you to to reach your full potential and expand your mind in a way that you can solve your problems and so this is why this type of attitude is more suitable for for the adherence to science than certain other religious traditions in Africa. So not all African systems are the same. And I'm not saying that these other systems are, are not valuable. What I'm saying here is notice the difference. Notice the, 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 the attitudes and notice the evolution among the people. So not everything that you see in modern African religions or spiritual traditions or wisdom traditions are super old and ancient people evolve 
but they evolve at different times. So there may be another group who are still on old, outdated ways of thinking, where there are other groups who have evolved. So when, when this concept of evolution and things, this is before the white man came into um, South Africa. There's no white people at this time. So this has nothing to do with white people in, in thinking like a Westerner. And so people try to throw that in the mix a lot. And that is not the case. And so um, I hope I gave y'all enough to, to ponder. And I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to listen to me, rave and banter, and um, sit with me even through the technical difficulties. And so all I'm saying is that there are there are African people who have moved um, who have moved forward and who who think like like I think, and I think that we should give them a listen and adopt certain attitudes like the Zulus of this time period of, of Tashaka Zulu, and and to understand that you know we we have history on our side. So when, when I say and I don't mean to be facetious. I don't want it's not a knock on on African religion and spirituality. When I say that the gods and goddesses will not help us defeat the white man, this is a result of history. We had all the juju and the science in the world, so-called science, spiritual science in the world. But they used science of this world and defeated us um, uh, thoroughly. And we got to admit that we were defeated. And so now is our time to rebuild. And we rebuild by expanding and strengthening our minds, leaning on each other, trusting on each other, and, and not waiting for some supernatural saviors, you know, uh, doing sacrifices to Ogun and things of this nature. Ogun is the same word where to get the word gun from. And I can demonstrate that. The very word gun and the very word ogun have the same root. So we know who had the who who worshipped ogun and who ogun was with uh, throughout history. The people with the guns. And so I'm not saying that we have to be violent and that we have to act like white people, but we have to think in terms of defense. And so we have to do things differently because perpetual evolution is the order of the day. You know. Um, and so, uh, uh, I pray that, you know, the, this message, you know, uh, uh, reach your, your, your heart and mind and that, you know, you reflect on what was said and understand that I'm not speaking out of my behind when I make my statements on Facebook, this comes as a result of 20 years, uh, 20 plus years of study, uh, studying African and black people. And and in understanding the 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 commonalities, but understanding the diversity in our histories, our worldviews, our way of thinking, and our applications of our centralized knowledge. And so we in the diaspora, you know, have to do something different. And just simply going back into to to African traditions uncritically is not the solution, you know, for us. At the end of the day, uh, we need to do, we need to be able to develop our own solutions and our own worldviews and customs, and one that is based on a reality and with a, a firm understanding of the law of umtetho, uh, and and the, and the perpetual evolution, the uh, uh, umtetho wem vuelo, uh, as the, the the Zulu would say. So uh, again, I appreciate everyone. Thank you for listening. And I'm signing out. It's 1 a.m. here. And um, so I'm get some studying done, probably get something to eat uh, or make something to eat. And uh, y'all have a good night. And so share the video, leave comments in the comment section. Uh, hit me up on Facebook if you like. Uh, keep the conversation going. And so, you know, uh, again, I appreciate you all. Uh, talk to y'all later. Hotel.